Chapter 1 The accident had shaken up the community. Not that accidents had not happened before in Greenwood, but in this case it was the sheer futility experienced by all involved. Two young lives had been severely affected, one fatally. It had all happened a week ago and as of yet, no one could venture a guess as to the final outcome. It was Sunday afternoon, the 28th of June. Normally a very quiet period in a Greenwood, a semi-rural community of approximately 7,000 souls just outside Phoenix, Arizona. State Route 31, the main road in town usually had very little traffic on Sunday afternoons. The only traffic was local residents who ventured out to the general store for some necessity. Sometimes one of the town's youth would be out for a drive to some friend's house. It was the latter that would lead to the tragic events that would shatter the tranquility of the community this particular day. The events to follow in subsequent days however would be even more bizarre if they ever became known. Amy Collins was not one to disobey her mother. She had been told countless times not to ride her bicycle on the main road. She asked her mother as they were leaving St. Mary's Church after Mass if she could ride her bike to visit her friend Debbie after dinner. She told her mother that they were going to work on finishing up a project for school tomorrow. She promised to go through the school's field behind her house and then down Debbie's street. This would be the safest way and she would not have to go out onto the main road. Amy's mother Lucy Collins gave permission but told her to be careful just the same and to be home by 3 p.m. Lucy reminded Amy that she had a first communion class to attend that afternoon. Amy promised to be home on time. She did not want to be late for Sister Angelica's class. Sister Angelica was Amy's fourth grade teacher as well as her catechism teacher. Being late for any of her classes would get someone in a lot of trouble. David Harris was proud as a peacock. He had just graduated from Greenwood High School and just received his confirmation on his acceptance into Arizona State University on a four-year hockey scholarship. As a gift for this achievement, his father had given him a brand new Ford Mustang. It was nice to have a wealthy father. For Dr. Lionel Harris, MD, Chief of Neurological Surgery at GSU School of Medicine, this gift to his son and his subsequent decisions would forever affect both himself and especially the life of his son David in unimaginable ways. This particular Sunday was a bright warm early summer day. The field behind the school was teeming with activity. Amy spent some time talking to some of her school friends. She soon left the field and got on her bike to ride down the gentle slope towards the street. Earlier that week unknown to Amy the town had started to dig up the edge of the road at the bottom on the slope to install some new sewer pipes. The edge of the road had been graded leaving the usually hard surface very soft and loose. When Amy's bike reached the bottom of the slope and started to turn onto the street, the wheels bogged down. Amy was thrown off the bike and into the road. She never saw the car that was coming towards her at the same moment. David was bored this quiet Sunday afternoon. His father was working the Sunday shift at the hospital and his mother was God knows where, probably off at some social event. He decided to take his new car to the school and show it off to some of his friends who were supposed to be playing a baseball game. As he came around first ST onto school ST he noticed a couple of the guys on the corner. They waved and gave him the thumbs up sign. David had turned to look over at his friends had he not done so he might have seen the little girl on the bike coming down the hill. As it was when he looked back at the road all he saw was a girl on a bike come out from behind the shrubs. David pulled the steering wheel to the left. It was too little too late. At the same instant, the Mustang struck the girl. David's car continued across the roadway to the opposite side. David was unaware of the tree his car hit or of the steering wheel slamming into his chest. Dr. Harris was probably the foremost researcher in neurological surgery in the Midwest although he was considered as somewhat of a renegade by his peers. He had published several research papers on the theoretical application of brain transplants as life-saving techniques and although he had had a great deal of success with laboratory animals at his research clinic at GSU, he had never been given permission to try these procedures on humans even though his clinic was a fully certified 10-bed emergency medical facility with all the latest research equipment as he proceeded with his volunteer duty at the hospital, he had no idea that several miles. Away his own son and a young girl were providing him the opportunity to do just that. The call came into the hospital from the ambulance crew that they were transporting two victims. 
The report stated that both victims were unstable. A young male with severe chest trauma and a young female with severe head injuries. CPR was in progress on the female. The male victim was showing very erratic heartbeat and low blood pressure. The hospital immediately went on alert. Dr. Harris was summoned to the emergency room in response to the report of head injuries. As the child was brought into the emergency room, she was taken to one of the examining rooms and the young man was placed in another. Dr. Harris was directed to the examining room for the female patient due to the nature of the head injuries. He did not know at this moment that his own son was in the next room. Examination of the girl showed no other injuries except for the large bruise on the left temple and some cuts and scrapes on her arms and legs. Her vital signs, however, were erratic. Dr. Harris immediately ordered the patient to have a CAT scan and EEG. Shortly thereafter, he would determine that the young girl was effectively brain dead, although she was being sustained on life support systems. The staff physician, Dr. Stanhope, was advised of the identity of the male patient and he immediately advised the other emergency room staff not to mention to Dr. Harris that his son was the other patient. Dr. Stanhope told them that he would take care of that as soon as Dr. Harris was finished with the girl. He could not possible get another neurologist for the girl should Dr. Harris become emotionally upset. This proved to be a wise decision. When Dr. Stanhope told Dr. Harris some time later of his son's condition and that it was his son who had struck the young girl with his car, Lionel Harris collapsed and was admitted to the hospital overnight for observation. At 8 a.m. the next morning Dr. Harris was released and told to go home and get some sleep. He would be advised of any changes in either patient. In the meantime both youths were admitted into intensive care. Amy's mother was also being held at the hospital. She had not taken word of her daughter's injuries well. She was still being sedated Monday morning. For the next three days the community held vigils for both young people. St. Mary's held a candlelight vigil for them each night at 6 p.m. And the members of David's Church, Greenwood Congregational Church, held a prayer service. The community was showing its sadness and frustration with the situation. On Tuesday morning, the young patients were transferred to GSU School of Medicine's Neurological Clinic. The facilities there were much more suited for treating the nature of the injuries. It was reported that David was showing some neurological problems also and that Amy was still not showing any brain activity. Lionel Harris had made a decision. It was obvious that Amy was dead. He had not told her mother so but he knew that it was only a matter of time before she came to that conclusion. As for David he was also going to die. The nature of his injuries from the crushing injuries from the steering wheel had done irreparable damage to his heart and lungs. Lionel had falsified the records to show neurological damage to David in order to get both patients into his clinic at the same time. If all went well, either David or Amy would be able to live. Lionel could also prove his theses on brain transplantation. Dr. Harris, unknown to himself, was also a little unstable. At this point, he was convinced that one life saved was better than none. It would be tough doing the surgery alone, but he had all of the necessary equipment and considered any other people knowing what he was about to do too much of a risk. He started operating early on Wednesday morning. The autopsy was completed on Thursday afternoon. The medical examiner had been summoned to the clinic after David had died. The medical examiner looked over the data supplied by David's father and decided that he would do the autopsy at the clinic. He was satisfied that the death had occurred on the operating table when it became obvious that David was in need of immediate intervention. The results of the ME's examination was that David's death was due to complications arising out of and because of the automobile accident. Death was ruled due to severe lacerations of the heart and lungs and complicated by swelling of the brain. The medical examiner had asked Dr. Harris why he had removed David's brain from his skull. Dr. Harris explained that it was really not necessary but that he was in need of some data for his research and that he could only get it by examining the underside area of a brain that had just succumbed. Since it was the brain of his son, he gave himself authorization. The medical examiner was somewhat taken aback by this but considered it to be strange but not illegal. 
considering that Dr. Harris had been able to stimulate the young girl into some brain activity when everyone else at the hospital thought she was brain dead was justification in his mind of the great work being done by Dr. Harris. Maybe this little bit of unethical behavior was just one more example of the validity of research. Thus ended the first part of the life of David Harris. A week after the accident, the Greenwood Police Department issued a news release in which David Harris was not held responsible for Amy Collins' injuries. The cause of the accident was one involving some unfortunate circumstances and that no charges was to be filed against David Harris. Chapter 2 Light A single point. Far away but intense. No matter how fast I run I cannot catch up with it, thought David. The light went out. Lucy received the call from Dr. Harris's office on a bright sunny Saturday morning in early September. At first she was worried that something had gone wrong with Amy. Dr. Harris was on the phone as soon as she returned the call. Good morning, Mrs. Collins. Thank you for calling back so quickly, said Lionel. Is anything wrong? said Lucy. Not at all. I just wanted you to know that I think Amy may wake up for a brief period today and you should be preparing yourself for this event," said Dr. Harris. Lucy asked, May I see her? Do you want me to come over now? Dr. Harris replied, No, not now. This first time is going to be confusing for her. I will let you know soon as to when you can see her. The good news is that she is getting better. Thank you, doctor. You have been wonderful, replied Lucy. When Lucy hung up the phone, she slumped into the sofa. A sense of joy and relief swept over her. Her prayers to the Blessed Virgin had not gone unanswered. The light was there again. Only closer this time. It was getting closer and closer. There was the sound of a rush of wind, thought David. The light went out again. Three weeks later David opened his eyes. It was a familiar place. He had seen in before. The large room filled with medical equipment, the large airy windows. He remembered. This was his father's clinic. He saw in the mirror on the ceiling a small figure covered in bandages around its head, laying on a bed nearby. The figure appeared to be looking at him. Apparently, he was not alone in the clinic. David tried to sit up. He found that he couldn't. He was unable to feel anything. Even trying to move his head was difficult. Why was he here? Then he remembered vaguely the crash. David saw his father come into the room. He looked haggard and walked with a noticeable stoop. Dr. Harris immediately looked toward David and observed that David kept looking in the mirror at the reflection. He sat down beside the bed. He had decided that he must tell David the truth. David, he said. I must talk to you. Chapter 3 Lionel Harris sat in his car and thought about the conversation with David. He knew when he went into the room that morning that that would be that last time he would speak to his son for a long time. He knew that he would have to surrender his son to Lucy Connors and that David would have to become her daughter. He had to talk to David and tell him what he had done and why. David had a right to hear from his own father's lips how he must now learn to be a ten-year-old again and also be someone else's little girl. The look in the girl's eyes were devastating to him. What was worse was that David could not yet speak and tell him what was going through her slash his mind. Lionel knew that David was going to need a lot of help during this transition and he could not provide it. Lionel had written a letter and sent it by courier after the talk with David to his close friend Dr. Ken Grant. He explained everything in the letter and asked his friend to take over the case. He trusted Ken to do the right thing for David. Dr. Harris knew that Ken would never divulge the information that he had given him in his letter. He had told Ken everything. He told Ken that he was resigning from the university effective immediately and that he would be leaving Greenwood. He asked Ken to watch after his son and that he had left a letter in his desk at home appointing Ken as the guardian of the trust fund that he had set up for Amy Collins. Amy was to be given everything that she needed to become the daughter that he would never know. When Ken Grant got the letter from his friend Lionel, he immediately tried to reach Lionel. When he had no success with this, he left his office for the day telling Susan his nurse-slash-receptionist that he would be gone for several days. He went to see Amy. Lucy had received the message from Dr. Harris that he was turning the case over to a Dr. Grant. 
he had explained that since the death of his son, he had need to get away for a while. Dr. Harris had explained that Ken Grant was the best in his field. He was a skilled neurosurgeon as well as specialist in the fields of child psychiatry and psychology. Due to the nature of Amy's injury, she was going to be in need of these services and Dr. Grant would provide it all without compensation. Lucy had been informed that Amy had regained consciousness briefly and that this was a good sign. Dr. Harris had told her that it could be some time before it happened again but that the EEG scans were showing marked improvement. Also a good sign. Lucy had visited Amy several times, staying long into the night but the little girl that she saw on the bed never made any sign of regaining consciousness. Lucy cried a lot during these times. She loved her child so very much. She would do anything to have her back. On each of her visits all that Lucy could see was the small head totally covered in bandages except for the eyes and a small opening for her nose and mouth. The room was full of all kinds of stuffed animals and other gifts sent to her by her friends and classmates. Once during a recent visit Lucy felt the child gently squeeze her hand. This gave Lucy hope. Earlier, Dr. Grant had visited with Lucy Collins. He had introduced himself and gave her the letter from Dr. Harris recommending that Mrs. Collins accept Dr. Grant as Amy's new physician. Lucy was ecstatic. She accepted Dr. Grant's offer of assistance in Dr. Harris's absence without question. I am going to have to have a few days with Amy alone. He told Lucy. I am going to have to evaluate her without having her distracted by visitors. After the evaluation, I would like you to come to the clinic and spend the day with Amy. I will just observe from another room by video camera. This will help me in my evaluation. He said. Lucy inquired, Doctor, what do you think Amy's chances are of a full recovery? At this point, replied Grant, and considering her progress to date, I would venture to say very good. Let me caution you on this, however. She has had severe brain trauma. For the next few months she may say and do things that are strange and completely out of character. She may even exhibit signs of amnesia. This is normal in cases like this. Patience, understanding and support are going to be critical on your part and on the part of anyone that visits with her. I would ask that you do not criticize her and that you brief all her visitors in this requirement. Lucy felt much better after talking to Dr. Grant. She agreed to follow the doctor's instructions to the letter. She was going to need a lot of strength over the next few months as Amy was going to try her patience to the limit. Lucy decided to have a talk with Father Clements. After Dr. Grant departed, she picked up the phone and called St. Mary's Parish House. The young form stirred. Dr. Grant had been observing his new patient for some time and was contemplating the methodology which he was going to use that would allow him to guide this youngster into accepting his new life as a girl without becoming mentally unstable if not insane. He knew that the implications were without precedent and he was treading on new ground here. In the end he decided on a straightforward approach. He was going to use as little medication as possible. Mild tranquilizers should suffice at first. Only time, patience, and understanding would be the rule. Of course David would have to be willing to cooperate. What he said to her here and now would be the most important conversation he would have with her. Grant knew if he botched it now it was all over. He would be left with nothing but an insane patient. What Grant did not know is that Harris had already talked to his son. Chapter 4 David had been dreaming. He was late to hockey practice. As he rushed out of the field house and onto the field all the activity stopped. The coach came over and looked at him. What are you doing here? He asked. Practice. Said David. Not your time. He said. Girls field hockey is tomorrow. David looked at the reflection in the glass doors. He saw a pretty girl with long brown hair who was wearing a girls field hockey uniform. The dream faded. He saw that light again. David woke up. David looked around the room. He did not think of anything at first. He saw the man sitting in a chair next to his bed. David looked right past the man and continued to survey the room. He saw all the stuffed animals and flowers. There were greeting cards stuck everywhere. Apparently, he was in the hospital. 
He could not understand the stuffed animals and flowers. There must be a kid in this room although he could not see over to the next bed as he could not turn his head. He looked back to the man. David said hello, with Amy's voice. Weak but undeniably that of Amy's David heard the little girl's voice. She must have said hello at the same time as himself. David just then remembered his father's confession of what he had done. David made a silent expression of anguish. Dr. Grant at that point thought to give Amy a tranquilizer right then. She must be in severe pain. But Grant stopped. He heard Amy say, Dad, you bastard. What have you done to me? Dr. Grant looked at the girl. You know? He asked. Yes, said David. Ken had decided that after reviewing the child's charts that it was time to remove the head bandages and examine the surgical area. Ken noted that he had done this two days earlier and that at that time there did not appear to be any complications. Lionel had given the child anti-rejection drugs. He had noted that by a stroke of good luck the two patients had the same exact blood type and very close tissue matching which he concluded would reduce the chances of Amy's body rejecting the transplant. David, said Ken, I am going to give you an examination and remove those bandages. You should at least see the results of your father's work. I am going to let you decide where we go from here. I will make you a promise, if you decide not to continue with this situation, I can at least give you a drug that will let you die in peace and without suffering. What I cannot do is give you your old body back. As far as the world is concerned, David Harris is dead and buried. Amy Collins survived. David replied, Doctor, I don't have much of a choice. I either live as a girl now or die. Let's see what my old man did. David was trying to be brave, he was actually scared beyond belief. Dr. Grant replied, Okay David, let's take a look. He pulled down the bed covers to look at the child. He picked up the scissors and gently started to cut away the bandages. When all the bandages were removed Grant looked over the incision area. It looked good. No signs of infection were apparent and the healing was coming along exceptionally well. He checked the child's eyes, there was good pupil contraction to the light. David he asked, does what you can see appear blurry or distorted? David replied, no, everything looks good. Let's see if you can sit up, said the doctor. He took the child's hands and gently helped the child to sit up. She sat up slowly. This was also a good sign as the doctor noted that the girl did most of the work by herself. The girl sat on the edge of the bed but was told by Grant to hold onto the rails. Dr. Grant removed the child's gown. What a beautiful child this is he thought. He could understand why Dr. Harris had wanted to save her. If David could only come to understand that maybe his father had actually given him a wonderful gift. Dr. Grant continued his exam. All the reflexes seemed to be returning. Except for a few bed sores, everything looked good. David had watched this procedure with intense interest in the mirror on the ceiling. It was the first time he had ever seen up close the unclothed body of a female child. It looked so delicate. Yet, this girl was very pretty even without any hair on her head. David decided to give this body and himself a chance to live. Of course he would owe Amy a huge debt. Whether he would be able to pay it back by making this work was very much in doubt. Doctor, I'm not a quitter. If I have to be a little girl now so be it. Said David courageously. Doctor, Grant replied, good choice David, life is always a better course of action. Time will resolve everything. You must understand that you will have a lot of obstacles to overcome. You will now have to learn to be 10 years old again. Learn how to be a girl and above all learn to love a new mother. David replied, all that is better than being dead, isn't it? Yes, replied the doctor, let's start by calling you Amy from now on. You will have to get used to that name. By the way, your mother's name is Lucy Collins and she is coming to see you the day after tomorrow. Dr. Grant noticed that Amy's heart rate increased suddenly. David stared at the little girl in the mirror for a long time. Anxiety overtook him. He became worried that he would not be able to make anyone believe he was Amy, especially her mother. David did not know anything about being a girl. Not to mention being a 10-year-old one. 
Dr. Grant returned to the room. David had not even noticed him leave, so intense was his thoughts. Dr. Grant was carrying some items of clothing. Let's get you looking like a girl, he said. On the bed he placed a pretty pink and white nightgown along with a matching bathrobe. Dr. Grant helped his patient put on the nightgown. David felt embarrassed as the doctor pulled the nightgown over his head. Under his breath he cursed his father. David felt helpless. Here he was in a totally strange situation that he had not asked for and was now going to have to face the rest of his life. David thought, this was never going to work. Maybe dying would have been better. Dr. Grant left the room and David was alone again. Dot he looked at the girl in the mirror. She was sitting in the wheelchair by the window. God she, I am pretty, thought David. Damn it. I am going to make this work and he fell asleep and dreamed. David awoke three days later to the sun streaming into the room. He felt much better. He looked around the room and noticed that he was no longer in the room with all the medical equipment. Instead, he appeared to be in a normal bedroom. The room was decorated with pink and yellow curtains on the windows. The floor was covered with a light pink blush carpeting. In one corner was a white vanity with a large mirror. A pink and gold chest of drawers was set to on one side of the room. The bed he was laying on was a white canopy bed with soft, fluffy bed coverings that matched the curtains and the rest of the furnishings. The child's tea table that had been in the hospital room was in another corner of the room. All the stuffed animals had also been moved into this room and was arraigned around the tea table. David concluded that he was in a bedroom designed for a little girl. It was a much more pleasant setting than the one he had been in before. But how did he get here? He asked himself. Chapter 5 Dr. Grant came into the room. Hi Amy. I hope you like your new room. I had you moved here last night while you were asleep so that you would not be under too much stress. Amy looked at the doctor for a moment and then asked, Am I still in the hospital? No, said Grant. You are now in your new bedroom that Mrs. Collins, excuse me, your mother has prepared for your homecoming. You are now home with her. She will be in to see you shortly. I want to talk to you first if you are up to it. And I think you are. How's this doctor? said David. Oh doctor I am so happy. Is mommy really here now? said David with as happy a voice as she could muster. Dr. Grant looked at his patient for a moment. That's good, David. Keep it up. It's a good start. Who is David? said the little girl. Good, let's work on that assumption, David. You need to start thinking of yourself as Amy. You really are her now, you know? said the doctor. Tell me about it, doctor. Look at me. Could I not know who and what I am now? I am going to make this work, though. I haven't got much choice now, do I? Dr. Grant helped Amy get out of bed and into a chair by the window. His logic was to get Amy up and moving around. He felt that she could manage this quite nicely considering her progress. There. Is that better, Amy? Yes. Thank you, doctor. Much better. Amy, you have been doing so well that I am only going to come by to see you every couple of days. My nurse will be coming by every day to change your bandages, but I think you are doing great and I would like you to try to get up and dress tomorrow for a little while. How does that sound? Oh, thank you, doctor. Do you really think I can get up for a while? Yes, young lady, I do. You have got to get some exercise and your mother has been instructed on what to do. All right, doctor. I promise to do everything you say. I really want to get better. Dr. Grant was amazed at the child's response. If he didn't know better he would have sworn that he was talking to the real Amy Collins. The doctor just shook his head in bewilderment. Okay. I am going to send your mother in now. Are you sure you're ready to handle this? Oh yes, doctor. Please, send her in. David was nervous, but he knew he had to start sooner or later to meet his new mother. It might as well be now. Lucy Collins came into the room and went straight to Amy. She reached out and embraced her daughter ever so gently and kissed her on the cheek. Tears were streaming down her face. Amy dear Amy, you had me so worried. Everything will be alright now. 
Mommy, I was so scared. I know, darling. I was scared too. Dr. Grant says you are getting much better now. Dr. Grant says I can get dressed tomorrow and get up for a while. Yes, dear. And I am going to have a nice surprise for you too. Oh, that's wonderful, Mommy. Can you tell me what it is? Why don't you wait and see? Right now I only want to look at you and hold you. The little girl and her mother held each other long into the afternoon. Neither wanted to break the spell. The sunlight streamed in the window. It traced a path across the floor and the slowly inched its way up the bed coverings. The first rays landed on the small face. The face of an angel asleep. David opened his eyes in response to the light. He felt an urgent need to go to the bathroom. Swinging his legs out of the bed he became immediately aware of how far the floor was away from his feet. As he looked down at the floor he suddenly became aware of his new situation. It wasn't that the floor was that far away, it was because he was so much smaller. Then he remembered, he was now a small child now. David held on to the bedpost. His legs did not want to move very well. Looking around he saw the door leading out to the hallway. David entered the bathroom and started to reach for his penis as he stood facing the toilet. His hand touched the soft material of his nightgown. He laughed to himself. Silly, I have to remember to sit down now to pee. He said to no one. David lifted the hem of his nightgown and sat down on the toilet. He was immediately aware of the way he urinated as to before. It sort of sprayed out rapidly instead of in a stream. As he finished he was also aware of his need to wipe himself now. His first female act on his own and that was strange. David wondered what other myriad of things he was going to find different. Lucy came running into the bathroom just as David stood up and flushed the toilet. Amy, what are you doing? Why didn't you call me? You could have hurt yourself. I'm all right, mother. I had to go pee and I didn't want to wake you. Oh, honey. Don't you worry about that. I know you are not well yet. I will always come when you need help. Lucy looked at the huge smile on Amy's face. She knew that Amy had just overcome a major hurdle. She was walking on her own. Lucy was smiling as was Amy. You're walking, dear. Yes, mother. Isn't it great? Said Amy. Amy reached out and put her arms around Lucy's neck. They both hugged each other. David said to himself in his thoughts, Nice going, kid. Lucy took the nightgown off Amy and while they were in the bathroom she ran a small amount of warm water in the bathtub and had her daughter sit in the tub. She gave her a sponge bath. Needless to say David took this opportunity to examine his new body close up. He could not believe how much different he now looked and felt. He was somewhat embarrassed but also enjoyed having a pretty lady do the work. Lucy was ecstatic. She had her daughter back and was determined that never again would she allow anything to happen to her little girl again. From now on she was going to fuss and primp over her and make sure that she had the opportunity to become nothing less than the epitome of the classical feminine child. As she finished washing Amy she helped her out of the tub and wrapped a bath towel around her. How do you feel now sweetie? Wonderful mother. I feel so nice and clean now. It has been a long time since I felt so good. That's great, dear. Let's go get you dressed and then I will give you your surprise. I have some lovely new clothes for you to wear. Lucy held Amy gently supporting her while they walked back into her bedroom. Amy sat on the edge of her bed as Lucy went into the closet and picked out a few items that were covered in white clothes bags. She also brought out a large round box with a cover on it. David looked at the items but could not see into the opaque bags. He was getting a little nervous. He knew that he was going to have to start wearing little girls' clothes now but he hoped that they would be kind of neutral in appearance and not something frilly and lacy. Lucy opened the dresser drawer and laid on the bed a pink nylon set of panties and camisole with dainty pink and white lace trim. She also laid out a pair of pink brocade pantyhose. David looked at the items and realized that he could forget about the neutral clothing. It was obvious that his new mother was intent on making Amy as pretty and feminine looking as possible. David thought to himself, well what did you expect, I am a pretty little girl now. Lucy turned to her daughter and smiled. 
Let's get you dressed. Lucy held the waistband of the panties open and David put his feet into the openings and slid his first pair of panties on. He was very conscious of how nice they felt as they were pulled up his small legs and over his buttocks. As he finished putting on the camisole and then the pantyhose he looked at himself in the dresser mirror. He saw the image of the little bald-headed girl in pink underwear looking back at himself. He was suddenly very aware of what he now was and who. Fear of the future overtook him. He started to weep softly like any little girl would. Lucy drew him to herself and hugged him. What is the matter, Amy? Do you need to lay down? Lucy asked in a very concerned way. No, mommy. I am just scared. Don't be, dear. I will not let anything happen to you again. I promise. Lucy replied. After a short while Amy calmed down and sat on the bed as her mother removed the items from the clothes bags. David's moth gapped open as he saw the pretty pink and white party dress and white bouffant slip the Lucy laid on the bed beside him. It was beautiful. She opened the round box and took out an exquisite long brown child's wig. These are your surprises, dear. No more bald head for you. Dr. Grant said you can now wear a wig until your hair grows out without any fear of infection. Said Lucy. David had to admit that if he had to dress as a pretty little girl, it might as well be these items. They did look great. Shortly Lucy had Amy all dressed and placed the wig on her head. The hair fell straight down her back almost to her waist. Lucy applied a little blush and gently brushed it into Amy's face. There dear. All done. Said Lucy when David looked in the mirror this time he was shocked. Standing there looking back at him was the prettiest little girl he had ever seen. She was an angel. David almost swooned as he realized that he was now her. The little girl hugged her mother. A new life was starting from that point. Chapter 6 For the first few days, David felt very awkward but he found it getting a lot easier. His biggest problem was trying to act as a little girl should instead of a 19-year-old man. It was good not to be confined to the bed any longer. David thought. Amy had now been home for over a month. She had met a few of her friends from school but there was no problem recognizing them or knowing her relationship with them as her mental companion told her everything that she needed to know. Her meeting with Father Clements was a very pleasant. She immediately took a liking to this gentleman. Father Clements had brought her a new prayer book and catechism a gift and told her that she had been given a special gift by God and that she should study it and treasure it. Did he have some sixth sense about her real self? Amy wondered. She would have to talk to Father Clements about this later. Today was Saturday and her mother had promised to take her to the mall for some new clothes. It would be her first time outside the house since coming home from the hospital. Amy had been told that she was going to get fitted for a communion dress. She was to have her first communion in two weeks. As much as he feared this trip outside as a girl, David felt he needed to do it. He had been under a roof much too long. Dr. Grant had come by a couple of times to check up on his young patient and even he was not sure who he was treating. He was just amazed at how David seemed to be acting more like little Amy than he would have expected. Her physical condition was improving daily. His main concern now was her ability to adjust to her new physique. Dr. Grant felt that if she continued to show progress mentally, he would soon have no reason to continue in home visits. He told Mrs. Collins that she could take Amy out on short trips anytime now. Two weeks later, Amy found herself standing in her room on Sunday morning while her mother put the finishing touches to her appearance. Amy looked in the mirror as her mother put the white veil on her head to complete her communion outfit. Amy was very happy with what she saw and how she felt. This was a wonderful finish to her long ordeal of recovery and transformation. She said a little silent prayer to herself. Amy reached out and embraced her mother. I love you very much, was all she said. Lucy looked at her daughter and then pulled her real close. With tears in her eyes, she whispered in Amy's ears, Thank you, dear. I love you very much, too. Chapter 7 A New Life I felt very strange. Here I was about to embark on a totally new life. Not only was I now a child again but a female one at that. 
I had a new mother, a new home and now I was about to take on a new religion as I stood in line with the other girls at the entrance to the church in my first communion dress. If I did not flip out and go insane by now I would probably be able to handle everything else that I would have thrown my way. As I knelt at the altar rail and received the host on my tongue for the first time I had a strange feeling that I was now alone. I said my prayer of thanksgiving and made the sign of the cross. As I knelt again in the pew beside my classmates I said a prayer for Amy Collins. I wanted to thank her for her gift to me. I had a sense then that Amy had heard me. I was now Amy totally. I turned my focus to my prayers and asked the Blessed Virgin for intercession in Amy, my benefactor's behalf. I prayed the rosary. I did become Amy. Completely. In time I really came to love this woman Lucy Collins who had given birth to this body if not my brain. I came to depend on her for everything. She did in fact become for me at least, my mother. I returned to school in Amy's fourth grade class and I eventually enjoyed the freedom of becoming a little kid again, even if it was as a girl. I must admit that the whole experience as a little girl became exhilarating and fun. I am now 16 and going to my junior prom at St. Mary's. My date, Jimmy Mulligan is an absolute doll. A gentleman for sure. He treats me like royalty and I like him a lot. Even my mom likes him. I hope to marry him someday. Thank you Amy, from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome David. Amy thought she heard from far off.